So 18 months ago, it's been a while now, 18 months ago we started our study of the Gospel of Mark. Since the author of Mark didn't write into his Gospel anything about the genealogy of Jesus or the nativity of Jesus or even the boyhood of Jesus, uh, we took a break from Mark's Gospel during Advent and Christmas time and during the first couple of months of this year. Until now, when we've reached a timely season to jump back into the Gospel of Mark, uh, take it up again. We're going to hold off on reading the passage of uh, Mark's Gospel at the beginning of chapter 11 that deals with what we think of related to Palm Sunday, Jesus' so-called triumphal entry. That happens at the beginning of chapter 11 in Mark's Gospel, and that's where we would be kind of as we pick up Mark again, but we're going to put off that passage of Scripture until Palm Sunday just for fun and pick up the Gospel of Mark in the passage that immediately follows that uh, today and then go forward from there so that everything that we read between now and chapter 14, which talks about Jesus' uh, last supper, last meal, etc., uh, everything between there and and then and there, here and then, uh, will uh, be about what immediately follows Jesus' so-called triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it will fit well with what we're doing during Lent. These are hard passages to say, hard passages to read and study, and in some cases understand. Uh, this is certainly the most difficult to preach and to embrace and to understand section in Mark's gospel, what we'll be covering for the next couple of months. But we're committed to covering every verse of Mark. That was our commitment when we started. So uh, regardless of how challenging it may be, uh, let's do it. You're going to have to work a little bit harder. So let's pray. God, as we uh, slow down, at least for a little bit together, we help hope that you will, by your grace, give us uh, an openness to your word. Help us to be attentive. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are good soil to receive your word. I pray and ask that as my words are true to your word and helpful, that they would be taken to heart. If my words stray or deviate in any way from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So beginning at chapter 11 of Mark's Gospel, verse 12, again we're jumping over the triumphal entry. Listen closely, this is God's word. The next day as they, they being Jesus and his closest disciples, as they were leaving the town of Bethany on their way to Jerusalem, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, Jesus went out to went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached the fig tree, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, Jesus talking to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Jesus' disciples heard him say it. They heard him. They were sure of what he said. They didn't catch it on tape, but they knew they heard well. And it's interesting that Mark makes that point. They heard him say it. Jesus' disciples are curious about every one of his words. They may be particularly curious now. Uh, Jumping over verse 15 to 18, now I'm going to pick up Mark's gospel in verse 19. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city, in other words, out of Jerusalem. In the morning, as they went along the road, they saw the fig tree, in other words, that same fig tree, withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I say to you, or truly, I tell you, And the Greek word translated into English as truly is in Greek the word amen. 
And the word amen is actually a remarkable word. It was, a, it was transliterated directly from Hebrew where it was also pronounced amen. So Hebrew to Greek, amen to amen, and on into Latin as amen, and on into English as amen, and many other languages as well, so that it may be the best known and most universal word on the face of the earth today. It's been called the best known figure of human speech. The word is directly related uh, and almost identical to the Hebrew word for believe, aman, or faithful. Thus it came to be understood as or to mean surely, or in our NIV translation, truly, an expression of absolute trust and confidence. At the end of a sentence or a statement or a discourse, amen meant and means so it is, or so be it, or may it be fulfilled. At the beginning of a sentence or a statement or a discourse, the word meant and means truly, or verily, or surely, or simply this is truth. Jesus used it often as a formula of solemn expression of his certainty. In the Gospel of John, the word is doubled for emphasis in the sayings of Jesus, and so amen, amen, truly, truly. You remember that from John's Gospel. And so in verse 23 of Mark 11, Jesus says, Have faith in God, truly, I tell you. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Have faith in God. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Pray and believe. Pray and same word, trust. Trust God. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Pray and mean it. Pray and be invested in your prayers. Pray and just don't say it, but also live it. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. That's a part of prayer. And for Jesus an essential part of prayer. And in other words, in this practice of prayer, embrace God's forgiveness enterprise, God's enterprise of forgiving that goes both ways and all ways. And so to recap, on his journey to Jerusalem, to his passion, to his arrest, trial, beating, whipping, and crucifixion, Jesus got hungry, saw a fig tree, Seemingly wanted some figs. He's very human in that way like us. He didn't get any figs because the tree had no figs. And so he cursed the tree which caused it to wither. And his disciples heard him say it. And is the lesson here that when someone's having a bad day, you just need to stay out of their way. (laughs) Our friends at Alcoholics Anonymous say that common triggers to bad and unhealthy behaviors or actions are being hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Not all the triggers, but big ones. H-A-L-T, halt. When I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, when I'm tired, you're better off just leaving me alone. Jesus curses this fig tree. And obviously this is problematic for the reader of Mark's gospel, for the person who wants to admire and revere and follow Jesus because Jesus here seems to be absolutely blowing a gasket, going postal. In the words of the soup shop owner Yev Kasim in the classic episode of Seinfeld, no soup for you to that fig tree. And this, the reader believes, is so out of character for Jesus that it disturbs us. What is one to make of this Jesus? 
On the one hand, I'm actually encouraged on one level that the passage, this passage is in Mark's gospel. I think it functions as evidence that Mark wrote down what happened and Mark wrote down what Jesus said and not just the pretty stuff, the lovely stuff, the easy stuff, the expected stuff, whether easy or hard to understand or embrace, Mark wrote it down and it wasn't edited out in the early years of the church or over the centuries in the church to make Jesus more domesticated, docile, or acceptable, tolerable to us or to modern ears or to his followers or to the world. This is the only miracle in the New Testament that involves destruction. But what's it all about? Jesus appears to be ruthless, merciless, angry, pitiful. The tree was innocent. The tree hadn't hurt anyone. That, in, that justice impulse inside of us says this isn't right, this isn't fair. That impulse has been flamed into action these last six days. We know injustice when we see it, when we feel it, when we witness it. What's up with Jesus and the tree? What's he got against an innocent little fig tree? It hadn't hurt anyone, and Jesus just blasts it. Mark tells us, when Jesus reached the tree, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. It wasn't even the season for figs. It was likely April. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem for Passover. Figs didn't ordinarily ripen until the early fall. It wasn't even the season for figs. Jesus would know that. What's up, Jesus? Scholars have struggled with this passage. Not just people like you and me. It's a hard nut to crack. We like, I like, meek and mild Jesus. I like merciful King Jesus, triumphant warrior Jesus, good shepherd Jesus, Savior and Lord Jesus, suffering servant Jesus, and even Lamb of God Jesus. What is up with fig tree killing Jesus? Well, as is always the case, The 24-hour period in the life of Jesus that we've just read about is best understood in context. In its context. Mark's account begins with Jesus heading toward Jerusalem one morning. It ends 24 hours later with Jesus walking away from Jerusalem. And in the middle that we skipped over earlier, verses 15 to 18, is Jesus entering the temple courts and driving out those who were buying and selling there. From verse 15, I'm reading now. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables and the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill Jesus for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. This was the last, or one of the last, of the passages that we read and worked through back in the late fall before we took our hiatus from Mark's gospel. And the facet of this passage that we focused on then as we talked about advancing God's purposes globally, one of our values, was God's passion for the nations who ironically were excluded, banned, forbidden from inner areas of the temple for worship. They weren't welcome there. On top of that, opportunistic capitalists were making loads of money off of pilgrims and worshipers, and particularly exploiting those who had traveled long distances, who brought with them foreign currencies that had to be exchanged at unfavorable rates into local coinage that would be accepted by and in the temple treasury. Jesus was livid. You've made my father's house into a den of robbers when it was intended to be a house of prayer for all nations. And so Jesus went on this rampage in the temple. And there's really no other way to describe it. That's what it has to be called. Jesus was livid. And that account happens right in the middle of these two counts or two-part story about the fig tree and Jesus' interaction with the fig tree. Between the two times that Jesus and his disciples walked by this fig tree, going and then returning. And so we see what we have 
We see here what we've seen before in Mark's gospel and talked about before. Maybe you remember what is called a literary sandwich. A literary sandwich, a literary tool that Mark uses in writing his gospel. Through which what happens in the middle is understood by and interpreted through what happens before and after. And what happens at the beginning and the end is understood and interpreted by what happens in the middle. And Jesus' interactions with the fig tree, in other words, the two pieces of bread in this literary sandwich, become a lived or embodied parable. And their meaning all of a sudden becomes much more clear. The meaning of Jesus' cursing of the fig tree doesn't seem like an isolated event, but its meaning all of a sudden comes clearer to us. It's not about a petulant, temperamental Messiah who missed breakfast. But instead about God's judgment, not so much on a tree, but on the temple and religion and religious leaders and exploiters of pilgrims and the poor and everything or so much of what Jewish faith and practice had become centered in and around the temple. Trees, you remember, all the way back to the early chapters of Genesis, all the way till the latter chapters of the book of Revelation. Trees often or usually have symbolic meaning in the scriptures. Do you remember that? And so also here. Jesus was pronouncing pronouncing judgment, not so much on a tree, but on the temple and on the empty, unfruitful, non-fruit-bearing religion that had grown up around it. And that had become more interested in self-righteousness and power than in faith or in believing and trusting God or in love or in justice. Those who oversaw and were responsible for temple life and to some degree probably those who participated in much of temple life prayed but not with their whole hearts and not with pure hearts. They embraced benefits of a relationship with God, but didn't share those benefits with all others or with people from afar. They sought God's forgiveness for themselves, but refused to forgive others. They judged others, but in so doing, brought judgment upon themselves. Instead of loving mercy, they loved money. So we've just finished six weeks in the first two chapters of the book of Acts, diving deep into the nascent church, the Pentecostal or the outward-focused and obedient church, the sacramental church, the praying church, the witnessing church, the generous church, and we've seen and talked about how the earliest church filled and refilled continually with God's Spirit, sought after God's heart and was about God's purposes, possessing God's power and bearing witness to the power of Jesus and God's love and living generously toward others in need, enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Do you remember that? But oh, how the church has strayed along the way from those beautiful days. How we have strayed along the way from those beautiful days. We read chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Acts, spent a lot of time deep diving there. But by chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we already run into people in the church who are lying to the Holy Spirit, notably Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit. And their lies were about greed and about keeping more of what they had to themselves and not being truthful with the community or with God about that. And over the centuries, the church has too often followed in their steps. And so may our prayers in this temple today be reformed and free of pretense and free of empty, fruitless religion. May our prayers, by God's grace, be honest and truthful and sincere and reliant on God. Have faith in God. Trust God in our praying. 
Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes. That's all three translations of the Greek word for faith, believe, trust in one sentence. Do not doubt in one's heart but believe that what they will say, what they say will happen. It will be done. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. May we, with God's help today and in the rest of Lent and beyond, give up our greed and our grudges. May we forgive others as we ask God to forgive us. May we forgive others as God has already forgiven us. May we live as generously and open-handed toward others as God has been and continues to be toward us and with us. And may this season of Lent be for us not so much a season of giving up chocolate or whatever, though there may be value in that, but a time to get honest with ourselves and with God and with one another in the church and with those outside the church as well. People don't participate in the church or Christianity or are turned off by following Jesus in our world today and for a long time, I'm sure, because the church is full of hypocrites, which is the Greek word for pretender or actor. And they're right. And there's always room for more because they are too. But our job is not to embrace our hypocrisy, which Jesus loathed, but to confess it and to actively repent of that, that we might live into the life God has for us and experience God's kingdom. We follow a truth-telling Messiah who we affirm sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We see that righteous and justified judgment expressed in Jesus' words and actions toward a fig tree and more explicitly and directly in Jesus' words and actions directed toward the temple and its people and its activity. May this Lent be a time of reflection and reform for us as a church and as a congregation and as people being more and more aligned with God's will, God's way, and God's heart. And according to Jesus, who came announcing his kingdom, the arrival of his kingdom with the words, repent, because it's close, the beginning of our invitation and the re-beginning of that invitation this Lent is to begin by confession. Ours. May it be so. May this be fulfilled. Amen, amen.